Hey guys, just thought I'd put together a really quick video because this morning I watched Bob Lazar on Joe Rogan <clears throat> and it was really brilliant. I'll put a link below. If you haven't seen it, um, it's well worth a watch. I think that at some point in about 95, 96, I bought a copy of 14 Times where they had something about Bob Lazar. And uh, obviously, I mean, it just seems too good to be true. Um, it, it's just absolutely incredible. And I think this is the way I go with it. And I don't know about you, but I read an article or I see something like this interview and I just think, wow, they're here. You know, they're here. They're coming here regularly. Thousands of people are seeing them. There's all these incredible stories. And I suppose for anybody who doesn't know about Bob Lazar, I guess it's worth a quick introduction. Late eighties, he was working at a, at a facility somewhere near area 51. I think it was called S4. He's a physicist who'd previously worked at Los Alamos. He was in the paper in the early 80s because he'd attached a rocket to the back of his car and he was sort of famous. And then he got to know some guy in a casual conversation. And then a few years later, when he was looking for a job, he ended up contacting this guy and he was given this very strange sort of contract work where you could be called a very short notice to go and do some work at this S4 facility that was top secret. Everything was broken out into, um, you know, need to know. You just needed to work on your part of it. Um, one day when he was going to work, the hangar doors were open and he walked in and he saw what looked like a flying saucer, but it had a US flag on it. And he was like, oh, great. You know, all these flying saucers that people are seeing, they're just US. Um, they're just secret aircraft that the US have created, that's good. But he did say that when he signed on for the job, he was given some information written down and he thought it was a test because it, it said all this crazy stuff about we've got these UFOs and we're trying to reverse engineer them. Um, just to add a little bit more, there are supposedly nine of these vehicles there. And one of the things that's absolutely mind blowing about it is that they say that they come from an archaeological dig, so they're really ancient, uh, which for me is like, is it possible that these are ancient human technology then? Anyway, and I'll tell you why I say that, because we all like to think that technology goes up in steps so that you can extrapolate backwards, but it doesn't seem to work like that. It seems to be that you reach a peak, there's some sort of apocalypse, it then gets torn right down to the beginning, you start again, perhaps with slightly different technology, you reach a peak, it gets torn down. Anybody who's been, I haven't been to um, mainland Greece yet, but I've been to Rome and my god, they built some massive stuff. Um, there was a, um, I, w I, w I want to do a video at some point about the Antikythera mechanism. Um, you know, there are, there are some like definite things that show that technology has reached peaks. The Antikythera mechanism, I've, I've got to do a video about this now, was as precise as a 19th century Swiss watch. It was either 18th or 19th century, but it was like, you know, stuff that we would consider to be pretty high technology and it's almost 2000 years old. So we like to think that everything goes up in a straight line um, which is why I think people have such a problem with so how come the last time somebody walked on the moon was 1972 and we haven't done it since and now we're trying to do it again and it's really difficult because it's really difficult that's my view on it so uh, anyway uh, this is like explosive tangents my brain's exploding ancient technology they dug these things up I tend to oscillate between like this morning, I watched Bob Lazar. I found him really credible. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, I watched that and I think, oh, right, they're here. And then um, 
I don't know, you just go back to normal life and you see stuff in the scientific community, on the media, whatever, where it's like, um, oh, SETI, we put up a big dish, we looked for radio signals coming from the stars, we didn't see anything. Then not even, like, eyewitness reports, oh, well, those people are just crazy. And let's get on with our lives and stop thinking about that. And, and then after a little while, I get sort of absorbed into that way of thinking. And then something like this comes along and it's a total shock because it's like, actually, in the Joe Rogan interview, he comes across, Bob Lazar comes across as really credible. Um, for anybody who's watched it, comment below. I picked up quite a lot of friction between um, Joe Rogan and Jeremy Corbett, is it? Jeremy Corbell. Jeremy Corbell. So Jeremy Corbell has produced a film called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. And uh, fair play to Joe Rogan for convincing these two guys to come on the show because I think it's a really positive thing because it's hard to bullshit for over two hours. And Joe Rogan doesn't grill his guests, but you know, he gets in there with some interesting questions so how did Bob Lazar do? I would say he comes across as a bright, believable, credible person. He comes across as somebody who's not obsessed with USO, with UFOs. He comes across as somebody who's a bit of a reluctant hero, doesn't really want to be famous, just wants to play around with tech, um, that apparently he hasn't got rich out of any of this. Um, that he's somebody who was completely destroyed um, as a warning to anybody else to come out and talk about it um, to the point where it's as if his birth records, his education records, they're all gone. Um, I don't know if he's a PhD. I think sort of implicit in all of this is that he's got a PhD in physics, um, but he can't prove that now. But there's there are, if you watch it, you'll see that there's there's lots of evidence that they couldn't destroy. So so that's kind of interesting. Uh, he's quite a credible. Oh, yeah, I suppose I should talk about he. I think it makes sense that somebody who's been through the experiences that Bob Lazar has been through would be anxious about going on to Joe Rogan. And so it would make sense that. Perhaps he could, he might turn up with um, a migraine, which he did. Hello, it's me here from the future. I'm editing this and uh, I don't think I explained that very well. He turned up with a migraine, which he put down to anxiety about going on the show because of all the things that have happened to him. Um, so at the beginning of the, of the podcast, he's got a migraine and the cynic in me was thinking this is a great opportunity for him to because you know like um if somebody asks you about something that's true um i'm the worst person to talk about this because people can ask me about stuff that's true and if they ask it in a way that's like are you lying then i stop believing myself <laughs> even though it's true i'm like i hear myself saying it and i'm like that sounds like bullshit <laughs> Um, so there is that sort of part of me that's like, I'm watching him and I'm thinking, are you using the migraine to cover the fact that you haven't got a coherent story here? But actually after about 30 minutes, and this is the beauty of doing, uh, over two hours, Joe Rogan podcast is that after he eased in, it all started to flow and, uh, you know, some of the evidence is amazing. Um, the only thing that I would challenge that seemed that felt a little bit dodgy to me was the discussion about gravity waves where Jeremy Corbell, where Jeremy Corbell was sort of saying, well, Bob Lazar said that there are gravity waves and you know, uh, a few years ago, they measured gravity waves, therefore, and I was thinking, 
that was that was Albert Einstein. 1915 general relativity and also as part of that discussion it seemed to be the 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 science had to land on whether it was a wave or a particle which did seem a little bit strange to me for a physicist because he would know that electrons and photons behave both as waves and particles so why wouldn't gravitons do the same so there was, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to give like a really balanced view on this and just my own bias is I really, 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 really want to believe that they're out there and they're coming here. And every time I hear an eyewitness talk about it, I'm like, yes, they're here. Um, but then, you know, in normal life, I'm not like really, really into the UFO phenomenon. Um, I listened to the last podcast on the left and Henry Zabrowski talks about it quite a lot and that's great I really enjoy that um, but you know it's not part of my day-to-day -day life but you definitely um, if you haven't seen it um, just go take a look at this interview it's absolutely fantastic and I think uh, that's it if you found this interesting me waffling on trying to untangle my own thoughts on something that I don't understand uh, you know I'll probably do that again quite soon so uh, uh, please like, subscribe, comment below, and uh, oh yeah, and I completely forgot to say uh, one of the really sort of crucial things was that what Bob Lazar and his buddy. So the idea was that you just chatted with your buddy. They didn't get together as a whole community and talk about this UFO. They just had two people who would work on one part of it. Um, he was saying that in the 80s the Russians were there at Area 51, which is pretty odd um, but that there was a major discovery made by one of the groups and the Russians were told to um, to leave um, that's that sounds crazy coming out of my mouth so but um, <laughs> uh, at one point he was allowed to go and look inside the flying saucer one of them one of the nine um, one of the things, like a really interesting detail, something that he understood, because um, essentially most of it was like impossible to understand. Um, something that he understood was that there was like a hatchway between the upper level and the second level. And it was made, he was saying that if you took sort of um, cardboard or something that had carried beer cans, I'm describing this really badly because I'm not quite sure what the reference was, but if you took some cardboard in a sort of a lattice pattern, you might actually be able to stand on it, it could be quite rigid, but that if you squeeze it this way, it's cardboard and it will just collapse. And apparently this hitch was, <clears throat> apparently this hatch was built on the same principle, you could actually walk on it, but if you just sort of pushed it to one side, it would just easily collapse. And that was interesting. and. I'm, I have no idea about body language or anything like that, but it was just, once he got into his flow, it all seemed really honest and genuine, um, like somebody was talking from their own experience. So what I wanted to say was that the bit that they were working on was some sort of reactor that when you put the top on it, it was like a, I think a hemisphere or something, that you put the top on it, it would just start working. The bit that I think Joe was trying to get at was how do you switch it off? And the reason that that's problematic is that if you put your hands down onto this thing, it was generating a, a, a repulsion field of some sort, which he was saying was definitely some sort of gravity field. And I suppose it's like, well, you know, if you turn this upside down and then you send it down through a pipe, then it can be used as a, as a propulsion system um, and that it could possibly be used to sort of warp space and time and all sorts of amazing things and uh, he used this fantastic analogy of if you were to put send a nuclear reactor back in time and you had people trying to understand that they have virtually no they have none of the tools that are required to understand it and it's very dangerous to handle um, but what he was saying about it powering up and powering off was that it seemed like all the components in this ship you just needed to put something near it and if something required energy you would put it near to 
this reactor and it, the reactor would power up and, and supply it. And again, it's like Arthur C. Clarke. Let's, let's end on Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's true. Thank you.